Greetings, fellow nerds. I have been tremendously fortunate to receive a gift of expensive lab equipment. In particular, I got a complete rotary evaporator system, also known as Rotovap. Okay, so first, what is a Rotovap and why would we want one? As you know, in chemistry, most of the time we perform reactions in solvents and then recover the products from that solvent. If the product is volatile, we do a fractional distillation. If the product is non-volatile, then we evaporate off the solvent. Evaporation is pretty slow though, so to improve recovery speed, sometimes we'll use heat to drive off the solvent by boiling. For even faster recovery, we may even apply a vacuum to lower the boiling point of the solvent. As amateurs, we almost never go to these lengths due to the complexities involved. But for professionals, time is money, and a way to separate solvents from products in an efficient manner is extremely useful. Additionally, vacuum drying may be absolutely necessary for substances that are too sensitive to heat for conventional boiling. But setting up a vacuum distillation apparatus every time you want to remove solvent from a product is itself time consuming. So it would be great to have a completely integrated piece of equipment for solvent removal using vacuum distillation with minimal labor and time. And that is what a rotovap is. It combines the various processes of vacuum distillation or low pressure evaporation to quickly remove solvent from products. But as you can probably tell, it's not cheap. So for amateurs, it's complete overkill and almost never needed by one. But for professionals that produce products on a preparatory scale every day, this is invaluable. So I am extremely grateful that a lab equipment company, GWSI Labs, reached out and just gifted me one. I would never have bought one myself. They are just too expensive. Running into multiple thousands of dollars for a complete system. So this gives us a rare opportunity to go through and examine a piece of equipment that most of us amateurs will never see. Now full disclosure before I begin, I am not paid or sponsored or otherwise obligated to make this video. This equipment was a straight up gift. But because it's a gift, there will likely be some unconscious bias in my examination and review, because we as humans tend to look more favorably and be less critical of gifts and things we get for free than of things we paid for with our hard earned money. That's just the nature of being someone who appreciates the kindness of others. So keep that in mind, I'm not trying to sell you guys anything, I am just very excited to even have one of these things. So let's get to it, I'm already unboxing it and I must say I'm quite impressed at how well and properly packaged this is. And that's all brand new. I was half expecting to receive defective charity, broken surplus, used detritus, or stuff that fell off the back of the truck. And after getting multiple things broken over the years during shipping due to bad packaging, my hopes were not high. But this is all pretty good. It's properly cushioned and protected. Even the extremely fragile condenser coil is filled with packing foam to absorb shocks. My cursory inspection shows everything is good and undamaged. This was definitely intended to be delivered to professional. I would have been happy just to get used lab equipment, but this is a treat. I can also be fairly certain I won't get killed accidentally touching the previous lab's nerve toxin research residues if there was no previous lab. <laughs> so let me start assembling this beauty. All parts seem to be properly labeled and packaged. Everything is here as it should be. One thing I don't like is that the pictures in the instructions are very low resolution black and white. I would have appreciated high resolution full color pictures to show exactly how everything fits together. Fortunately, I have assembled rotovaps before during my professional career, so this was very easy. But if you're assigning some intern fresh out of undergrad to set this up, then these instructions could be better. Anyway, as I went through it, I hit a hiccup with this ceiling ring tearing open. This ring maintains the vacuum between the moving parts of the rotovap. Fortunately, the company knew this ring was a weak part, so they included another spare ring which I've already installed. Hopefully this one doesn't fail before I have a chance to test it. And here is the complete system all set up. The sample is placed in the flask gear and it's heated up by the water bath. The solvent vapors travel up through to the condenser where they are condensed and collected. The product is left behind in the flask. That is the basic operation, but for speed and ease of use, there are a few major improvements that the Rotovap takes advantage of. The most obvious one and where the machine gets its name is the ability to rotate the flask while it's being evaporated. 
and that's why it's called the rotary evaporator or rotovap. We can adjust the speed and handle mixtures of different viscosities and consistencies. There are gaskets and slip rings inside the machine that allow us to keep the condenser still while the flask rotates, but still maintain a nearly airtight seal. Okay, so why do we want to rotate the flask? There are a couple of reasons. First, the tumbling action stirs the product so it evaporates faster and does this without a stir bar. Stir bars can be inconvenient, especially when you want to weigh your product. Second, the tumbling action reduces a problem called bumping. That's when the mixture flash boils so violently that it shoots up into the condenser and splatters everywhere. This contaminates the rotovap and also loses valuable product. So anything to reduce bumping is desirable. Thirdly, rotation causes the product mixture to coat the inside of the flask by surface tension and effectively increases the evaporating surface area, allowing us to evaporate even faster. You can't really do that very much just by stirring, and this gives the rotary evaporator a tremendous speed advantage. To further compound the speed advantage, most rotovap systems use a vacuum to lower the air pressure and thus lower the boiling point of the solvents being removed. With a lower boiling point, it's easier to boil off solvents, and this is especially important when boiling off solvents that have higher boiling points than water, like xylene and toluene. The water bath can only heat up to near the boiling point of water, so a way to reduce the boiling points below that is tremendously important. I'm going to bring the camera over and peek at the connections back here, and you can see the condenser connected to two insulated water coolant lines, and in the center is the vacuum line. The vacuum line is connected over here to this vacuum pump. This pump is just a high-powered professional version of the aspirator pump I showed you in a previous video. In here is the water reservoir for the pump's working fluid. I won't go into its operation in detail here, you can look at my previous video, and I'll include a link in the video description. But these pumps are advantageous over more common rotary vein and scroll pumps because they are much more chemically resistant. So even in a professional machine like this, they have their uses. Over here we got the vacuum gauges. The actual vacuum level itself isn't all that important since we're not doing fractional distillation. But these are very useful for figuring out if you have a vacuum leak. If so, there might be a loose connection or broken seal somewhere. Now this particular unit also has a water recirculating pump. The idea is that this one unit can also be connected to the condenser and provide both water cooling and vacuum pumping with the same reservoir. I'm not using that function because I have a separate water chiller, but this is an option if you want to save money and don't need to rotovap very blow boiling point solvents like diethyl ether. But what if you are? Normally, if you're rotovapping a high boiling solvent like water or xylene, then a water cooled condenser is sufficient to capture it all. But if you're dealing with a very low boiling point solvent, like acetone or diethyl ether, room temperature cooling water is too warm to effectively condense it all at the high rate it's being boiled off. The answer of course is to chill the coolant down to below room temperature, and I have that unit down here below the camera frame connected by those two insulated black coolant lines. It's pretty much refrigerator but focused on cooling a tiny reservoir here. You can see the metal refrigeration coil is inside, and I've currently filled the unit with water. Although if you want sub-zero temperatures, you can also fill it with alcohol or ethylene glycol antifreeze mixture. These chillers also have their own integrated coolant pump, which is very convenient. Something I want to point out is this inconspicuous little plug down here. This is the drain plug for emptying the reservoir of coolant. This chiller is much too heavy to lift up and tip over to empty it, and it's actually dangerous to do so since it uses a refrigeration compressor. You don't want the compressor to be damaged by improperly settled refrigeration fluid. So this plug can be used to drain and clean the chiller without moving it. Since I'm down here, I'm going to open up the side panels and peek inside. There is little scientific value for doing this, I'm just very curious. I always wanted to open one up but was never allowed to during my employment. Now I can finally get to do it and no one can stop me. And there we go, we can see the refrigeration compressor. It's pretty big. The same size you would find in a large fridge, and it seems to be mounted on top of rubber vibration isolation mounts. On the left side, we see the condenser coils and fans. In total, a very straightforward setup. I'm going to go to the other side now, and there is the coolant pump. 
Although the coolant lines are very well insulated to prevent condensation, even the pump head is insulated so the company took their time to make a quality product. Ok, my curiosity is satisfied, let's get back to the video. Anyway, that was the water chiller unit. It's optional and if you're only dealing with high boiling solvents then you can get by just using the water cooler in the vacuum pump. But if you're handling low boiling solvents then it's something to be considered. So a couple more minor features before we actually use it. The rotovap here has a lift motor to raise and lower the system in and out of the heated water bath. Other rotovap systems I've seen don't have motors and instead have a hand crank or lever to jack up the system. And I've seen some very cheap systems that don't have any lift capabilities at all and instead raise and lower the water bath itself. For many years I worked in a lab where the lift system actually broke, so we had to lift the water bath. It was not fun. Ok, anyway, we finally have the gas valve and feed through line. At the end of a solvent removal procedure we turn off the vacuum and let air or gas back in through this valve. This is designed with this hose barb so we can connect different gases if we want. For example, if we're working with air sensitive compounds, then we may connect this to a nitrogen line and fill the system with nitrogen gas. But most of the time we'll just be opening it to air. Now I want to draw your attention to this gas feed through tube inside the system and goes all the way to the product flask. The incoming air exits through this tube. It's a simple thing but has a number of useful applications. By filling the product flask with air here, it lets us purge the flask of any lingering vapors at the end of the solvent removal procedure. This is useful in case we're dealing with highly toxic solvents. Alternatively, if we're working with air sensitive compounds we can feed through inert gas here and ensure we're purging air from the flask as we operate. Another use for this is to blow air or gas in while the solvent is being removed to help in the removal of very badly behaved or unruly solvents. As mentioned before, solvents can sometimes violently boil and shoot into the condenser losing product. We call this bumping. To prevent bumping, Weaker heating can be used as well as deliberately opening the gas inlet valve partially and allowing air in to reduce the vacuum. Weak vacuum in the apparatus reduces bumping. But this greatly reduces the evaporation rate and why it's always a constant battle between high vacuum and high evaporation rate against bumping and product loss. But by feeding the incoming gas into the flask, the gas can be used to blow onto the solvent and dry it directly. Just like when we blow on something wet using our lips to dry it. So by using this gas feed through tube and carefully opening the gas valve, we can drive off badly behaved solvents that would bump or splatter under harder vacuum and still maintain a high evaporation rate. In some labs I've worked in this tube went missing or was broken. So rotovaping a solvent took much longer and was a much more delicate procedure due to bumping problems. It's such a small innocuous thing that even professional chemists sometimes overlook it. And because the rotovap still works, just not as well, most will just forget about it. Ok, I've talked enough. Let's actually demonstrate this expensive piece of equipment. Here I have what might be a highly valuable product dissolved in a solvent. Ok, I'll be honest, it's just tap water. But let's pretend it's something super valuable like calcium carbonate dissolved into hydrogen monoxide to justify this demonstration. Now we just connect to the rotovap and use this retaining clip to hold it in place. Some rotovaps have separate clamps, but the idea is to prevent the flask from falling off into the water bath. Speaking of which, I am now lowering the flask into the water bath. I am going to insert the gas inlet valve now. I took it out earlier so it would be easier to put on the flask without the gas feed through tube sticking out. That's optional though. The water bath is just to gently heat the flask and drive off the solvent. I'm going to set mine to 60 celsius which is reasonably hot without being too dangerous. Now we turn on the rotation. The exact rate is something you find through a lot of trial and error. You want to be fast enough to form a film on the inside of the flask through surface tension and centripetal force, but also be slow enough that the liquid tumbles and mixes as it evaporates. You also want to find a rate that minimizes bumping and other undesirable behavior. I don't know any rules, I just keep adjusting until I get a good rate. The water chiller was already set to 10 celsius and is currently circulating. I've also switched on the vacuum and the apparatus is currently pumping down. I'm going to use as hard a vacuum as I can as water is generally well behaved for a solvent 
and I don't expect much bumping. So I will not be cracking open the gas inlet valve to reduce the vacuum. There is a water bath cover to reduce evaporative losses, but for the purposes of filming this I'm going to leave it off so we can see what's happening. But by all means use a cover if you have one. And there it goes. It's only been about 4 minutes since I turned on the vacuum and already the vacuum has reached low enough that we're condensing the water. Let me zoom in on the condenser, and it looks pretty good. I'm actually quite impressed. I've used other rotovaps and this one is working quite quickly. It might be because the vac pump is right next to it so the rate of pump down is very quick. In the industrial and academic labs I've worked in, the vacuum pump was hundreds of meters away, usually on roofs. So the pump down rate was quite slow. You might be wondering if the solvents are recovered and reused. Usually not. Because oftentimes the condenser is contaminated with residues from previous procedures that bumped and splattered into the rotovap. The condenser needs to be carefully removed and rigorously cleaned before any recovered solvent is pure enough to reuse. Since rotovaps are used in highly time constrained labs, such rigorous cleaning is often not done and just cursory cleaning is performed. Nonetheless, the solvents can be reused if they are again fractionally distilled. It really depends on the policies of the lab. I personally have never worked in a lab where the solvents were recovered. They were almost always disposed of. So it looks like it's going very nicely, we're not getting any bumping or unruly behavior, and despite the low water bath temperature, we're moving the solvent rather quickly. It only took about another 20 minutes to finish. And there it is, all done. To shut it down, we first turn off the vacuum and then let air into the rotovap. We may even remove the gas inlet valve altogether with the gas feed through tube, but that's optional. Now we turn off the rotation, and then lift the flask. Now we just remove it, and there is the residual tap water scale that we're pretending to be some super valuable product. All of that took just 25 minutes. You can see why rotovaps are big business and why many labs have them. The time of a chemist is very valuable and can justify spending thousands of dollars on a piece of equipment that can save many hours of work per week. Additionally, the process is quite gentle using low heat and high vacuum so sensitive compounds aren't as degraded if we had hard boiled it at atmospheric pressure and full boiling temperature. For amateurs though, this is massive overkill and very hard to justify buying something so extravagant. So I want to thank GWSI Labs for gifting me this piece of equipment, as I never would have gotten it any other way. I'll be setting up the rotovap elsewhere in my lab. I'm also going to stop using my own amateur aspirator vacuum pump and instead use this professional one because I'll be honest, it performs much better and faster than my amateur unit. And this water chiller is really awesome. It can actually go sub-zero and I'm going to try and find a way to perform sub-zero amateur chemistry with it. Maybe condense liquid sulfur dioxide and other chemistry. Thanks again to GWSI Labs. Before I go, I've been asked to discuss exactly how you would clean something like this. Especially after bumping has occurred and it's all contaminated with unwanted residues. It's not too involved, just very slow and difficult to get completely clean. First, all of the parts are disconnected. The receiver flask is removed and the coolant and vacuum lines are drained and disconnected. The condenser is then removed with the various springs and rings, and that's the condenser. It's extremely delicate so you gotta be careful handling it. At this point, the neck can be cleaned directly to an extent with a brush and solvent if needed. But I'm going to dismantle that too. And there is the neck along with the sealing ring and gasket. So these are all the parts that get contaminated during bumping and need to be cleaned. This is most often done by soaking them in water or solvent if necessary. The rubber sealing rings and gaskets are damaged by solvents, so they need to be scrubbed with soap and water only, or completely replaced if they are too damaged. The glass parts are often cleaned in an ultrasonic bath for thorough cleaning. Of course, the biggest problem is the condenser. It's too intricate to scrub, unlike the neck. If you have an ultrasonic cleaner big enough to contain it, then that would be great. If not, and I certainly don't, then a lesser alternative is to continually soak it in water. I have here a bucket of water, but I also use alcohol if the residues are more soluble than that. I put the condenser in upside down, and then I use a small pump and feed a thin tube down into the bottom of the condenser. You can see the bottom of the tube there. 
I turn on the pump and continuously feed water through the condenser, and I leave it in there for hours or even days. The constant motion of the water helps to loosen and remove residues over time. Granted, it's not nearly as good as ultrasonic cleaning, but it's an option if one isn't available. For ultimate cleaning, Another option I've seen is to take the whole condenser and bake it in an oven to burn the residues off. Then the whole condenser is immersed in aqua regia and then piranha solution. Yeah, that particular lab really needed clean. And there you go. I hope this video is interesting. As amateurs, we almost never get to interact with professional grade equipment like this and see the inner parts. Thanks for watching. Special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making these science videos possible with their donations and their direction. If you're not currently a patron but would like to support the continued production of science videos like this one, then check out my Patreon page here or in the video description. I really appreciate any and all support.